Hello, welcome to CIA Files, True Stories of U.S. Intelligence. I'm your host, Topher M. Ford, and with me I have Brandon Givens. Brandon, how goes things? Ah, uh, they're going pretty well, yeah. I think uh, I think we got a good episode. People are going to get a, well, I don't know if you'd call it closure, but kind of closure no, on this character. No. <laughs> well, on, on uh, the character, yeah, we're talking about James Jesus Angleton. This is our third and final installment telling his story. And he is, he was, uh, it's a doozy of a story. He is one of the people who's most responsible for the air of mystique around the CIA. And he helped stir up a lot of conspiracy theories because he was so secretive. He had a, sort of formed his own CIA within the CIA that he sort of ran his own little miniature CIA. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he plays a key figure in a big part of the CIA history that we have yet to discuss, but we will be getting into now. And that's the assassination of John F. Kennedy and how uh, Angleton ended up like his actions ended up contributing greatly to the uh, mystique and the conspiracy theories that still surround that. And will never go away. No, <laughs> never. I think even if they came out and were like, Oh yes, the CIA and the mafia were behind it. And these were the goings who said, there's a conspiracy to say that the mafia is guilty. <laughs> or something. Right. There's a conspiracy about the conspiracy. I I don't think anyone would ever unless like somebody came out with a videotape that showed Khrushchev and Fidel Castro and uh like J. Edgar Hoover and the director of the CIA all sitting in a room together with Lee Harvey Oswald, you know, with a big sign that said plans for us all to kill Kennedy. That's maybe the only thing that would well, add all of their parents there saying, that's my boy. Yeah. <laughs> that's my boy right there. Oh, and Meyer Lansky and the mafia, they would have to be in the room also. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like the Kennedy assassination was pretty crowded. <laughs> yeah. uh, people can't keep, that many people can't keep a secret. Come on. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's uh, get into it. This is part three of Jim Angleton. We are not professing to tell you the complete story of these activities. We are professing to tell you the complete story that we know. These records that we've uncovered don't tell the story. This is CIA Files. They tell pieces of it. True stories of U.S. intelligence. Presidents come and go. But the intelligence bureaucracy remains in place as the real ruling class in our political system. Joe Trento Fundamentally, the founding fathers of U.S. intelligence were liars. The better you lied and the more you betrayed, the more likely you'd be promoted. These people attracted and promoted each other. Outside of their duplicity, the only thing they had in common was a desire for absolute power. James Jesus Angleton. While Jim Angleton's Russian benefactor, Anatoly Galitsyn, seemed to feed him a string of paranoid conspiracies and fabulous fictions, he did provide useful information from time to time. Perhaps one of his biggest reveals was the spy, Alexander Kopatsky. During World War II, Kopatsky served as a Soviet intelligence officer. He was captured by Germans after parachuting behind enemy lines and was offered a chance to work for Nazi intelligence. He agreed and was sent to the front lines. In 1944, he was placed in a group of former Soviet troops sent to cover the rear of German soldiers as they retreated from Allied forces. Instead of fighting, he surrendered to the Americans under the name Igor Sasha Orlov. He later joined the Galen Organization, the ex-Nazi spy ring that worked with the Americans in Germany after the war to counter Soviet spies. 
1951, he was recruited by the CIA and sent to Berlin. One of his talents was seduction, so the CIA decided to use him in several honeypot operations where he would seduce Soviet women and turn them into CIA agents. His efforts always fell short, though, never producing any useful intelligence. For one of his operations, Orlov was paired with another new CIA recruit, an Estonian refugee named Vladimir Kivi. However, Kivi failed to turn up on the date of their operation. He wasn't at his apartment, but all of his belongings were. CIA officers figured that he'd been discovered and kidnapped by Soviet agents. As it so happened, though, Orlov had done the kidnapping himself, sending Kivi to his doom. The failure of Orlov's other efforts was no accident either. Orlov had been working secretly for the KGB from the beginning. He made certain that none of the CIA's targets had any useful information and that the KGB always knew about every operation Orlov was given. CIA officer Peter Sichel never trusted Orlov and tried to convince the Berlin office not to use him, but they failed to heed his warnings. Sichel said, It was a classic example of case officers falling in love with their agents. I tried to tell them they were being played. Unfortunately, in this case, they refused to listen. Due to Orlov's failure to produce any useful intelligence, the Berlin office eventually decided to stop using him for operations in 1955. But the slow wheels of bureaucracy kept him on the CIA payroll for two more years. He and his family were eventually relocated to a home in Alexandria, Virginia. In 1961, well after Orlov's damage had been done, Galitzin outed him as an agent of the KGB. Thanks to Galitzin's information, the agency finally severed all ties to Igor Orlov, whom they finally knew as Alexander Kapatsky. But because they lacked any substantial evidence against him, official charges were never filed. Kapatsky died a free man in 1982. The full extent of his deception only came to light in the 1990s when researchers were given access to files from the time when he'd worked for the CIA. Kapotsky spent the last years of his life living peacefully in Virginia, running a small art boutique with his wife. When his crimes finally came to light, well after his death, his widow began selling Soviet Cold War memorabilia. Whatever useful information Galitzin provided to Angleton, it's unclear whether his overall contributions added up to a plus or a minus for the agency. Whether intentional or not, Galitzin's efforts were often damaging, both to the agency and to many individuals who were genuinely trying to help. Galitzin also worked to convince the CIA of another falsehood, that the schism forming between the Soviet Union and the Chinese Communist Party was a massive, coordinated ruse meant to lull the West into a false sense of complacency. Political ideologies are not that different from religious ideologies. They have their prophets, their holy books, their symbols and rituals. They promise a better way of living, and they usually have like some form of salvation or future utopia. And just as Christianity is split over debates about the true meaning and will of Jesus' words, the Sino-Soviet split is based on different interpretations of Marx. When Soviet Premier Khrushchev began de-Stalinization and trying to basically make friends with the West, Mao took offense. The Soviets were no longer true communists. Instead, they were revisionist who revised the words of Marx, watering them down to fit their needs. Mao had imitated Stalin closely, so embracing de-Stalinization might have been a bad look for him. So with this split, 
the Soviets and the communists began competing for being the leaders of the future of world communism. Communist parties around the world would have to pick who did they look to for guidance and support. Galitzin had convinced Angleton that any people trying to defect to the United States after him were Soviet spies looking to infiltrate the CIA. So when KGB officer Yuri Nosenko offered himself to the United States, Angleton insisted that he couldn't be trusted and helped convince the agency's Russian office to imprison him. Yuri Nosenko was the son of the Soviet Minister of Shipbuilding. He worked in naval intelligence for a bit, but was transferred to the KGB in 1953. He was stationed in Geneva at the time of his defection. In 1962, he contacted the CIA in Geneva, wanting to be a double agent. His story is he had been robbed by a prostitute and needed money. The CIA agreed to pay him for information. In 1964, at his meeting with the CIA, he made the claim that he had been discovered, so he needed to defect immediately. The CIA took him to the U.S. His story wasn't really believed. It was thought he might be a triple agent. He was basically imprisoned and interrogated for two years, eventually being believed, pensioned, and freed. In his reports to his handlers, he said that the KGB did investigate Oswald, but never recruited him. They thought him too stupid and a nut. Nosenko was kept in solitary confinement in a CIA black site for four years, being constantly interrogated the entire time. When he was finally released, his information did prove valuable. He went on to advise the CIA for decades. After Golinson's eventual release, he angrily confronted Angleton over the phone. Angleton deflected any responsibility for Nosenko's captivity, and soon after the call began, he ended it by saying, Look, I don't have any time for you on this. In 1960, Angleton, dealing with the stresses of his position, which were almost certainly worsened by his excessive drinking, suffered a mental break, and he was forced to take a leave of absence. By the time he returned, a new president was in office, and a new operation was in the works, this time focused on neutralizing the relatively young communist government of Fidel Castro, who'd overthrown Cuba's U.S.-backed dictator, Fulgencio Batista, in 1959. Castro had sent himself into exile to Mexico, where he organized a little guerrilla organization. They bought a ship called Grandma and sailed to Cuba. Their leaky boat arrived late, missing an internal uprising that had happened. They fled to the mountains, but they started a guerrilla campaign against the Cuban dictator Bautista's forces. Over time, they grew stronger. They received money and support from Cuban exiles who were enemies of Bautista. At this point, it wasn't clear if Castro was a convinced communist, just that he was against the dictatorship of Bautista, who had removed a democratically elected president. So, Castro received weapons paid for by Cuban exiles via Frank Sturgis and Samuel Cummings. The latter was a CIA Um, arms expert. Sturgis trained the rebels in guerrilla war. Eventually, Bautista loses popularity and the U.S. stops supporting him. The rebels march into Havana and a provisional government is declared. Castro was prime minister, but after disagreements with the president, he resigned. Pro-Castro protesters demanded the provisional president resign, which he did, Castro became premier again when a communist was appointed president. So what scared the U.S.? Well, the new Cuban government put a cap on farms at being at about 993 acres. Land above that was confiscated and distributed to small farmers. They also began rent controls. 
They began rapid school, health clinic, and road building projects. Uh, but what really concerned the U.S. was that the sugar industry was nationalized and foreigners were banned from owning land. When Cuba made a trade agreement with Russia, Cuba ordered that the American-owned factories in Cuba refine Russian oil. They refused. And so the Cubans nationalized the oil industry as well. The casinos were also shut down, which hurt a lot of pockets in the U.S., especially in the Mafia. Basically, the West feared that communist takeovers would lead to their overseas property and investments being nationalized. Much to the CIA's chagrin, Fidel Castro had been gaining popularity within the United States. He abolished racial segregation and enacted strong social welfare programs to help the people of Cuba, which endeared him to those in the rising civil rights movement happening in America at the time. Despite this, Angleton, along with many others within the CIA, the State Department, and the Pentagon, pushed for an aggressive stance toward Castro, with many endorsing plans for overt military intervention. President John F. Kennedy, however, had decided on a more diplomatic approach. His attitude was considered risky and weak by many who worked under him, including those in the CIA. JFK's experience with the generals was not positive. He started out thinking that they had some kind of special knowledge and experience, you know, being career military men and all, but he found over time that their advice seemed rather worthless. He also found that they seemed fond of the idea of using nuclear weapons, believing the, the you know, he found that these generals believed that the civilian population had an irrational fear of them. One general even told him, if we fight, and in the end there are only two Americans and one Russian, then we've won. So it seems anything less than bomb to the enemy into submission was seen as weakness. This is a, not an attitude that impressed or inspired Kennedy. And he's known to have said to an aide, these brass hats have one great advantage. If we do what they want us to do, none of us will be alive later to tell them that they were wrong. Kennedy managed to work out a deal with Khrushchev. The Russians would remove their missiles in Cuba, and the U.S. would remove their missiles in Turkey and Italy. Kennedy thought his diplomacy might be for naught. He expressed to Khrushchev fear that the military might remove him. The military seemed to see this compromise as a show of weakness. Kennedy and Khrushchev do go on to try to work out um, more nuclear disarmament and you know, the reduction of the number of missiles out there. While Kennedy's diplomatic approach averted nuclear disaster, his military leaders felt the U.S. came out on the worse end of the deal. They believed that Kennedy missed an opportunity to expel Castro and the communist government from Cuba altogether. Angleton shared this view. When he returned to his office in 1961, he found his colleagues in the midst of planning a covert operation to train Cuban rebels and send them to Cuba to spark a popular uprising that would ultimately unseat Castro and destroy the communist government. Angleton's counterintelligence group insisted that this endeavor would be welcomed by the Cuban people and that Fidel's military forces would be easily defeated. Thanks to this deduction, the event known as the Bay of Pigs would end up being just one of many times that the U.S. government grossly underestimated Castro, as well as one of many of Angleton's failures in counterintelligence. President Kennedy was hesitant to approve this operation, but he gave it the green light, being assured that neither U.S. troops nor U.S. air support would have to get involved. Kennedy was all about getting rid of Castro as long as it didn't um, involve U.S. troops, well, especially in a way that you know, it could get pinned on the U.S. The CIA and the Joint Chiefs tried to sell him on direct invasion, 
um, but said it would be possible to remove Castro by arming dissident Cuban exiles and allowing them to stage their own invasion. Now, the, later on, we find the CIA didn't really believe that story, but that's the one they sold Kennedy on. It should be noted that the Joint Chiefs told Kennedy it would be super embarrassing if they did fail and that they'd likely have to send troops or else lose face. Perhaps they thought that might scare him out of the plan and he would just opt for a direct U.S.-led invasion. Well, the Bay of Pigs invasion ended worse than could be imagined. The beach had coral reefs that sank some of the exiles' ships. Their paratroopers landed in the wrong place. They ended up pinned down on the beach and surrendered within 24 hours. Uh, four Alabama pilots who the CIA had recruited, they died as well. This whole incident fueled Kennedy's distrust of his military advisors. Uh, he said, The first advice I'm going to give my successor is to watch the generals and to avoid feeling that just because they were military men, their opinions on military matters were worth a damn. Uh, there's some stuff going on in the news now that might make a, make a president doubt the trustworthiness of his military advisors. Angleton, not one to willingly accept accountability for failure, blamed the fiasco on Cuban spies penetrating operations in South Florida. Once again, he manufactured confirmation of his suspicions that a Soviet mole was wreaking havoc on the CIA's plans. At 12.30 p.m. on November 22, 1963, President John F. Kennedy, riding in an open convertible through downtown Dallas, Texas, jerked his hands up to cover his mouth and throat. Seconds later, his skull exploded, splashing blood and brains on everything and everyone around him. Within half an hour, a doctor would pronounce the 35th President of the United States dead. Reactions from around the country were strong but mixed. While many were horrified by the sudden violent death of President Kennedy, some Americans celebrated his death openly. In an interview with 10TV WBNS, one man who was in school when he heard the news described what he heard down the hall. Douglas Gray was a sophomore at Murrah High School. He was taking a test when the announcement came that someone had fired on Kennedy's motorcade. His teacher ordered the class to be silent. But from other rooms, this is what he heard. Cheering and whooping and hollering. Applause. And people were clearly ecstatic. The next period in music class, students learned that Kennedy had died. That teacher ordered everyone to stand and sing Dixie. Kennedy was a proponent of integration and considered by many to be soft on communism. Those cheering, literally cheering, his death were groups in line with segregationists and outfits like the John Birch Society. Malcolm X commented that the assassination was an example of chickens coming home to roost, a thing that usually made him glad. As a general rule, though, his assassination was viewed with sorrow, horror, and a renewed sense of reconciliation on the right and left. This event would affect just about every American alive at the time, as well as millions of people around the world. And it would prove to be quite inconvenient for Jim Angleton. Lee Harvey Oswald, a relatively unknown figure to most people, had just been accused of shooting the president. And while most people might not have known who he was before November of 1963, Angleton was quite familiar with him. This fact, which wasn't known to many people, even within the CIA, had the potential to ruin Angleton's career in the agency. If it was known that he'd been keeping close tabs on a known communist sympathizer who successfully assassinated the President of the United States, he'd likely be cast out of the agency he'd helped build and his prospects for employment elsewhere would probably become fairly limited. But Angleton didn't become chief spycatcher through sheer luck. 
He'd gotten there through shrewd cunning and cold manipulation. And so he put those talents to work immediately to cover his own reputation and to direct attention away from himself. Theories about who was behind Kennedy's assassination began spreading immediately. The first theory was that Fidel Castro was behind it. Castro, however, was quick to deny any involvement in Kennedy's death. He rightly assumed that his enemies in the United States would eagerly use this as an excuse to intensify their efforts to usurp him, whether they actually believed it or not. Castro said in a speech immediately after the assassination, We foresaw that from these incidents there could be a new trap, an ambush, a Machiavellian plot against our country that on the very blood of their assassinated president, there might be unscrupulous people who would begin to work out immediately an aggressive policy against Cuba, if the aggressive policy had not been linked beforehand to the assassination, because it might or might not have been. But there is no doubt that this policy is being built on the still warm blood and unburied body of their tragically assassinated president. In the days that followed Kennedy's murder, Angleton began providing information that he had on Oswald to the Secret Service. But most, if not all, of this information was already available in Oswald's 201 file. Angleton managed to keep a significant portion of what he'd known about Oswald away from investigators. A CIA officer named John Witten was assigned to compile all of the information he could find on Oswald within the CIA's files. He naively assumed Angleton would want to help in this effort. Instead, Angleton did what he could to stonewall Witten. Years later, Witten said in a secret session, In the early stage, Mr. Angleton was not able to influence the course of the investigation. He was extremely embittered that I was entrusted with the investigation and he wasn't. Witten and Angleton spoke with CIA Director Dick Helms. Witten later said that Angleton ruthlessly criticized his report without pointing to any specific faults, but rather reiterated that the report had too many errors to be taken seriously. Helms decided to trust Angleton and put him in charge of the CIA's investigation. Now, Angleton was in the perfect position to protect himself and the agency, which is exactly what Helms wanted. From the start, Angleton's primary goal was to ensure that the full extent of his knowledge on Oswald's activities and sentiments went undisclosed, as the CIA was called to report to the Warren Commission. Nicholas Kosenbach was LBJ's attorney general. He's the one that suggested a congressional investigation of the Kennedy assassination. He thought the public needed to see an unbiased and open investigation, one that would be made public. He wanted to combat speculation and conspiracy. Some didn't really want the investigation to occur. They figured it would create more controversy than it would solve. LBJ took his advice, though, and assigned Chief Justice Earl Warren to lead the investigative commission. One glaring omission from Angleton's testimony to the Warren Commission was the CIA's efforts to assassinate Castro. Angleton was well aware of the CIA asset Rolando Cubella, also known as Amlash. Ronaldo Cubella was a founder of a revolutionary student group in Cuba. They opposed Bautista and made common cause with Castro. After the revolution, after the success of the revolution, Cubella was made deputy secretary in the Ministry of Government. He worked on reconciling the different revolutionary factions, but he became disenchanted. Cubella concluded that Castro had betrayed the revolution by becoming a communist dictator. Cubella came into contact with an old friend, Carlos Tependido who worked for the CIA. Cubella became an asset in plots to assassinate Castro. In one episode, he was given a poison pen. The CIA cut ties with him in 1965, believing him to be too risky an asset. It appears he was discovered by Castro soon after. He was tried, 
spared the death penalty and sentenced to 25 years. Castro pardoned him after 13, and he relocated to Spain. Castro almost certainly knew of the CIA's intention to kill him at the time. This fact would have pinned a strong motive to the Cuban president, self-defense. But Angleton, with the help of J. Edgar Hoover, likely in an attempt to cover up his own knowledge of Oswald's activities, steered the Warren Commission's attention away from Castro and directed focus toward the KGB, despite the fact that there was little to no evidence that the Kremlin was involved in Kennedy's assassination. Whether or not Fidel Castro played any part in Kennedy's death, Angleton's intentional omission of Amlash and other CIA attempts to neutralize Castro constitutes obstruction of justice. Despite this, or perhaps because of it, Angleton not only avoided scrutiny, but strengthened his role within the CIA, which he would maintain for another decade. In the wake of John F. Kennedy's murder, rumors and conspiracy theories bloomed everywhere like algae. Angleton himself was the source of many of these shadowy suggestions, either through propaganda or through his efforts to cover up his own failings. But his connection to one tragic chapter in the mystique surrounding Kennedy's death was likely a terribly unfortunate coincidence. Or maybe not. Coincidences and synchronicities are still difficult to suss out to this day, and the truth will likely remain obscured forever. This particular story revolves around the untimely death of one of Jim Angleton's friends, Mary Meyer. Mary Meyer was an acid-dropping, pot-smoking, painter housewife married to a CIA agent. It was definitely an odd couple situation. She was quite familiar with the high-level DC intelligence scene. She was friends with the Wisners and the Angletons. And a very unfortunate event, one of her children died after being hit by a car. He was running across the street. The strain of this event appears to have led to her divorce. Sometime thereabout, she had an affair with JFK. It was believed she brought pot and perhaps LSD with her for their rendezvous. She cut off the affair some months before Kennedy was assassinated. President Kennedy seemed to remain enamored with Mary after she ended the affair, writing to her in a letter. I know it is unwise, irrational, and that you may hate it. On the other hand, you may not, and I will love it. You say that it is good for me not to get what I want. After all these years, you should give me a more loving answer than that. Why don't you just say yes? At the start of her affair with the president, Mary had gotten directions on how to lead him on an acid trip from her friend, Harvard psychologist and LSD guru, Timothy Leary. Leary later wrote in his autobiography that she'd been quite upset after Kennedy's death. Ever since the Kennedy assassination, I had been expecting a call from Mary. It came around December 1st. I could hardly understand her. She was either drunk or drugged or overwhelmed with grief. We're all three. She told Leary. They couldn't control him anymore. He was changing too fast. They've covered everything up. I've got to come see you. I'm afraid. On the afternoon of October 12th, 1964, Jim's wife, Cicely, was at home listening to the radio when she heard a police report. It stated that a woman had been killed on the C&O Canal towpath in Georgetown. Cicely immediately became worried and called Jim. Cicely and Jim were close friends with Mary Meyer, and Cicely knew that she went on regular walks down that exact path. Jim assured his wife that the victim almost certainly wasn't Mary and reminded her that the three of them had plans later that day to attend a literary event.
When they arrived at Mary's home that evening to pick her up, she didn't answer the door. It was unlocked, so Jim went inside. Finding no one home, he called Mary's answering service, only to be informed that she was dead. Mary Meyer had indeed been the woman mentioned on the radio. Around midday, she'd finished a painting and decided to go for a walk while it dried. While walking, she crossed paths with Polly Wisner, wife of CIA officer Frank Wisner, and the two women exchanged pleasantries before Polly drove off. Sometime after that, she was confronted on the path by a light-skinned African-American man, according to an auto mechanic who said he'd seen them. He said that the two struggled briefly before the man pulled out a pistol and shot Mary twice. Then the man walked away from Mary as she lay bleeding on the path. Friends of Mary's gathered at the home of her brother-in-law, reporter Ben Bradley. Ben Bradley served as a naval intelligence officer during World War II. After the war, he worked for a small-town paper as a reporter. Uh, the paper was bought out, and he found himself without a job. Uh, he lands eventually lands at the Washington Post, and he bounced around in the journalistic world for a bit, um, kind of moving up along the way. He was a European correspondent for Newsweek for a few years. He toured with Kennedy and Nixon during their campaigns. Uh, but perhaps his biggest claim to fame was when he was executive director at the Washington Post. He fought the government for the right to publish the Pentagon Papers, and he backed Woodward and Bernstein's Watergate investigation. Upon remembering that Mary was caring for some kittens, the group relocated to her home to check on them. Someone ordered food and alcohol, and the group was soon drunkenly processing the day's events while sitting around Mary's living room. After hearing the news, Ann Truitt, a mutual friend of Mary's and the Angletons, called from Japan, where she was staying at the time, and asked to speak to Jim. She told Jim that Mary had a diary, and she'd said that if anything were ever to happen to her, she wanted Jim to have it. The group of friends began looking for Mary's diary, knocking on walls and turning over bricks in her backyard, but they didn't find it that night. In his 1995 memoirs, Ben Bradley told a different version of the story. He claimed that they didn't search for the diary until the next day. He said he returned and Mary's home was locked, but Angleton was already inside looking for the diary. According to Bradley, they didn't find it then either. Bradley claimed that he returned the next day with tools to pick the padlock that locked the door to Mary's art studio. Again, he said he found Angleton there already trying to pick the lock. Bradley said Angleton left and he picked the lock himself, finding Mary's diary in the studio. He said he passed it along to Jim the next day. After some years, Angleton gave the diary to Tony Bradley, Ben's wife and Mary's sister. Tony, in the company of Ann Truitt, burned it. A man named Ray Crump Jr. was arrested and charged with Mary's murder, but was later acquitted. Her murder remains unsolved. While Angleton could be considered, for better or for worse, a dedicated American patriot, not all of his decisions were made with the best interests of the United States in mind. One such possible decision may have arisen concerning Israel's acquisition of nuclear weapons. Israel wanted nuclear weapons from the get-go. They reasoned it would protect their people from another holocaust. Many of the scientists who worked to make the original nuclear bomb for the Americans were also Jewish themselves. Israeli leadership reasoned the, the talent should exist within its own community, and if not, it should be fairly easy to quickly develop. They cooperated with France, sharing research information and intelligence. 
France helped build a reactor for Israel with the understanding that it was for peaceful purposes. The Israeli Prime Minister announced the reactor was to provide power for a pumping and desalinization plant that was going to use seawater to irrigate the desert. Well, Charles de Gaulle became president in 1958, and he insisted that Israel open up the facility to inspections to ensure that it wasn't being used to build weapons. This was not something Israel was willing to do. Uh, they conducted some negotiations, and Israel still refused to open up the facilities, but technical assistance continued until 1966, but France stopped delivering uranium in 1963. Well, Israel found other sources. Um, the U.S. and France were not thrilled by Israel's pursuit of nuclear weapons. The U.S. found they couldn't pressure Israel into stopping without letting it be known what Israel was up to, and they feared that that would lead to an Arab nuclear arms race funded by the Soviets. So, the U.S. opted for a policy of ambiguity, kind of a don't ask, don't tell with regard to Israel's nuclear ambitions and capabilities. NUMEC, the Nuclear Materials and Equipment Corps, produced and distributed uranium-235, the material used in nuclear power plants. It's also the material needed to develop and build nuclear weapons. NUMEC would supply some friendly nations, including Israel, with uranium-235 to use in nuclear power plants. However, in 1966, the Atomic Energy Commission concluded that around 200 kilograms of the material was unaccounted for. After an investigation, half of that amount couldn't be traced to anywhere. It had simply disappeared. CIA scientists were certain that Israel was in possession of this missing nuclear material. However, the CIA failed to cooperate with the Department of Energy and Nuclear Regulatory Commission in following up on this suspicion. Since then, it is widely believed that Israel possesses up to 400 nuclear weapons in its stockpile, although they've never confirmed nor denied this. In The Ghost, Jefferson Morley points out that Angleton was close friends with many of the key Israeli figures who would have played a part in the acquisition of uranium-235 and the subsequent development of nuclear weapons. John Haddon, a fellow CIA officer who investigated the issue, concluded that Israel did indeed possess nuclear weapons and that they stole the material needed from Numec. He concluded that the situation was either a result of gross incompetence on the part of U.S. intelligence, or it was allowed to happen intentionally. He said of the matter, If the crime had been committed intentionally and was not the result of carelessness, then the circumstances warranted a finding of high treason with a mandatory death penalty. Haddon, however, didn't include any names in his report. In 1969, Richard Nixon became President of the United States, bringing with him a moral and legal philosophy distressingly similar to Jim Angleton's. This common bond became apparent after a bomb went off in a Greenwich Village townhouse, bringing attention to a group of radicals known as the Weather Underground. A group called the Students for a Democratic Society were up and coming in the 60s college scene. They were fairly left being against the Vietnam War and for racial equality. They wanted more participatory democracy and for the industrialized world to make more of an effort to share the wealth with the developing world. Over time, some members came to the conclusion that social activism alone wasn't enough and that violence was warranted. So, a splinter violent organization was born. The Weathermen, who come to be known as the Weather Underground. 
they wanted a white militant organization to work alongside the black organizations then in existence. They end up becoming pretty much a cult. Property and income was shared in common. The leaders were highly respected and questioning them was discouraged. They took something that is healthy, like self-introspection into subconscious bias into a ritual meant to reinforce loyalty. They regularly grilled each other on the purity of their beliefs, purging heretics. People needed to confess to unconscious racial biases, class and sexist biases, and any others they might have. But then they were criticized for having them, or heaven forbid worse, not confessing them. Guilt builds a strong work ethic. This technique was successful and useful in rooting out moles, though. They wanted attention for their cause. They also thought the Vietnam War unjust and wanted to bring that war home, in a sense. So they began a bombing Molotov cocktail campaign. In 1969, they bombed a monument to the police and inspired a riot in Chicago, which cost over $100,000 in expenses and damages. In the last week of the year, the leadership met and decided that guerrilla warfare and human casualties was acceptable. In 1970, a cell in New York City blew itself up making bombs. They had planned to attack a military dance. After that, the leadership decided that human casualties really should be off the table. From then on, they would bomb empty offices and give warnings to people so they could clear out beforehand. Some surviving members went on to argue that they shouldn't be considered terrorists and that they didn't target people. They targeted property and would issue warnings to locations so they could clear out before the bombs went off. However, some Weather Underground members appear to have worked with the Black Liberation Army in their bombing of a San Francisco police station that left one officer dead. After two Black Panther members were killed uh, in a police raid, they declared war against the U.S. government. They followed this up with setting off 10 sticks of dynamite at the New York police headquarters. They called in a bomb warning six minutes prior. They set off a bomb on the Senate side of the Capitol building, and on Ho Chi Minh's birthday, they set off a bomb in a Pentagon bathroom. Um, perhaps my favorite antic, um, they accepted $10,000 to successfully assist LSD-promoting professor Timothy Leary break out of jail and escape to Algeria. Much of the evidence against the weather underground was deemed inadmissible because it was gathered illegally. This provided an opportunity for members to come out of hiding. The group split between those wanting to stay small and underground and those who wanted to come out of hiding and build an open mass movement, not based on using violence for attention, though accepting of violence as being perhaps necessary in the future. They eventually dissipate as an organization some rejoining open society and others joining other revolutionary organizations. Nixon, deeply disturbed by the thought of leftist revolutionaries being active on American soil, demanded that the CIA and the FBI, along with the still secret NSA and the newly formed Defense Intelligence Agency, take drastic steps to end what he saw as a grave threat to American values by expanding domestic intelligence gathering efforts. Angleton saw this as an opportunity and quickly acquainted himself with the president. Angleton, along with FBI Assistant Director Bill Sullivan, assembled what they called the Houston Plan, named for a rookie politician named Tom Houston, an aide to Nixon. The plan outlined methods for reading mail and monitoring communications of American citizens. Legally, Angleton's mail reading programs were supposed to have stopped years ago, but Angleton wasn't one to be bothered by laws. 
he included some choice phrasing in the Houston plan to make it seem as though these programs would be resurrected rather than just redirected. They monitored key figures in the weather underground, as well as the Black Panthers and liberal think tanks like the Institution for Policy Studies. Left out of this decision was U.S. Attorney General John Mitchell. When Mitchell finally found out about it, he was appalled. He disapproved for several reasons, not least of which being the damage the plan would do to Nixon's re-election campaign if the public found out. So Nixon withdrew his approval for the Houston plan, which meant that Angleton was directed, once again, to shut down his domestic surveillance operations. And once again, he didn't. The summer of 1972 would prove to be a bad time for President Nixon. It would also mark a turning point for Jim Angleton, whose own illegal activities would be exposed as a result of Nixon's troubles. In 1973, Nixon was inaugurated as president for a second time despite the looming investigation of the Watergate scandal. Two men connected to his staff had been caught attempting to break into and bug the Democratic National Committee's headquarters, and Nixon, claiming he had no knowledge of the break-in beforehand, would be impeached and later would resign from office after facing charges of obstruction of justice. But before the situation went totally sideways for Nixon, he made sweeping changes to his administration. After his re-election, he replaced his cabinet members. He also fired Angleton's friend and close ally, CIA Director Richard Helms. Helms had worked hard to cover for Angleton's shady methodology. Unfortunately for Angleton, his next boss wouldn't be so accommodating. Nixon appointed a man named James Schlesinger to lead the CIA. Schlesinger was surprised to learn of the CIA's apparent assistance in the Watergate debacle, as well as plenty of other CIA secrets. Schlesinger told Arthur Tom Mangold about talking with Angleton. Listening to him was like looking at an impressionist painting. Jim's mind was devious and elusive, and his conclusions were woven in a quite flimsy manner. His long briefings would wander on, and although he was attempting to convey a great deal, it was always smoke, hints, and bizarre allegations. He might have been a little cracked, but he was always sincere. He ordered reports on current and past operations from every senior official and tasked CIA officer William Colby with compiling the report, which would come to be known as the Family Jewels. Angleton and Colby were not friendly. More pragmatic than philosophical, Colby didn't approve of Angleton's extra-legal methods. He was shocked by what his report uncovered. Soon after appointing Schlesinger to CIA director, Nixon decided to make him Secretary of Defense, and Colby inherited the role of director. Colby tried to give Angleton the benefit of the doubt, but failed to see the logic behind Angleton's long, meandering reasoning and abstract literary approach to counterintelligence. Then, the Senate Watergate Committee learned about Angleton's secret illegal domestic surveillance operations. Soon, Angleton would find himself in an uncomfortable spotlight. Since taking over the CIA, Colby had been trying to get Angleton to retire. He asked Angleton to step down voluntarily and proposed that he write a history of his role in the agency. But Angleton refused. He'd have to be fired, or he wasn't leaving at all. Colby said, I couldn't find that we ever caught a spy under Jim. That really bothered me. Every time I asked the second floor about this question, I got, well, maybe, and perhaps, but nothing hard. The isolation of counterintelligence staff from the Soviet design was a huge problem. Everyone knew it. The CIA staff was so far out on its own, so independent, that it had nothing to do with the rest of the agency. The staff was so secretive and self-contained that its work was not integrated into the rest of the agency's operations. There was a total lack of cooperation. 
New York Times reporter Seymour Hersh, who'd won a Pulitzer for his reporting on war crimes committed by U.S. soldiers in Vietnam, caught the scent of operations chaos and lingual and began digging. He spoke to Director Colby, who indirectly confirmed but ultimately downplayed the truth of Hirsch's story. Then, in December of 1974, Hirsch informed the CIA that he was running the story, exposing Angleton's domestic surveillance operations to the public. Colby summoned Angleton to his office, where he told the counterintelligence leader the bad news. Colby informed Angleton that this was his last chance to retire before he'd have to be fired. Angleton left Colby's office in a desolate mood. He went to a payphone and called Hirsch. Hirsch said of the conversation, He told me he had other stories which were much better. He really wanted to buy me off with these leads. One of the things he offered sounded very real. He said it was about something the United States was doing inside the Soviet Union. It could have been totally poppycock. Who knows? I didn't write it. Even if Colby hadn't been trying to get rid of Angleton before, he had no choice but to fire Angleton after the story ran. Colby appointed another man, George T. Kolaris, to Angleton's post and charged him with digging through Angleton's massive secret archives. Angleton said to Kolaris, It's nothing personal. It's just that you are caught up in the middle of a big battle between Colby and me. I feel sorry for you. I studied your personal records and, I repeat, you are going to be crushed. The archaeological excavation of Angleton's archives took a team of specialists three years to complete. They found more than 40 safes full of files on all sorts of people, including other CIA officers and agents, as well as journalists and even politicians. Calaris also said he found, quote, bizarre things of which I shall never speak. The archives were culled to somewhere between 150 and 200 files, and the rest were destroyed. Given that Angleton was an intensely secret man, public attention hardly seemed like something he ever wished for. Seymour Hersh's article had brought Angleton plenty of attention, but after his expulsion from the CIA, Angleton found himself under an even harsher spotlight during the United States Senate Select Committee to study government operations with respect to intelligence activities, informally known as the Church Committee. Frank Church was a World War II veteran, and during the war he had been in military intelligence. His most consistent theme in office appears to be supporting honesty and integrity in government. He wasn't afraid to vote against his party. He believed in the philosophy, right or wrong, you love your country, and this is how you show it. When it's right, you celebrate that. When it's wrong, you bring it back to right. Though initially in favor of the Vietnam War, he came out against it and is believed to have criticized LBJ in his office over the Gulf of Tonkin incident, the criticism being LBJ lying to the voters. He didn't believe you could expect democracy to thrive with voters in ignorance. He was also vocally wary of spy agencies lacking oversight. He feared it could lead to tyranny, and once trapped in that, the nation would find itself hard-pressed to escape. With a history in military intelligence and a reputation for honesty and transparency, and general fear of spy agency abuse, he was a good pick to lead an investigation into such abuses. The Church Committee was a Senate Select Committee headed by Senator Frank Church. They were to investigate abuses by the U.S. intelligence community as well as the FBI and IRS. The committee began work in 1975. It unearthed all kinds of gems like MK Ultra. The report, the end report, was six books long. 
Angleton, of course, disapproved of Church's efforts to rein in the CIA. He told the CIA's chief liaison officer to Congress, The Church Committee has opened up the CIA to a frontal assault by the KGB. This is the KGB's chance to go for the jugular. The whole plan is being masterminded by Kim Philby in Moscow. The KGB's only object in the world is to destroy me and the agency. The committee is serving as the unwitting instrument of the KGB. Frank Church grilled Angleton relentlessly. He managed to get Angleton to admit publicly that he'd kept up the domestic surveillance programs even after the president told him to stop. He also uncovered that Angleton had lied to President Nixon. At one point in the hearings, Church said, So that the commander-in-chief is not the commander-in-chief at all. He is just a problem. You do not want to inform him in the first place because he might say no. That is the truth of it. And when he did say no, you disregard it, and then you call him the commander-in-chief. In 1977, despite everything that had been uncovered, the church committee announced that no charges would be brought against Angleton, setting a dangerous precedent that would pave the way for even greater surveillance programs in the future. An attorney from the committee said, Prosecution of the potential defendants would be unlikely to succeed because of the unavailability of important evidence and because of the state of the law that prevailed during the course of the mail-opening program. Jefferson Morley wrote in Ghost, The Justice Department's decision not to indict Angleton set a precedent and sent a message that the secret intelligence arm of the government could reserve the right to review, without warrant or stated cause, the private communications of Americans in the name of national security. On April 25, 1975, Jim Angleton was awarded the Distinguished Intelligence Award for Performance of Outstanding Service or for Achievement of a Distinctly Exceptional Nature in a Duty or Responsibility, the results of which constitute a major contribution to the mission of the agency. Although officially fired, Angleton remained on the CIA payroll for an unknown period of time afterward, seemingly at his full salary. The official line from Colby was that Angleton was kept on as a consultant, limited to greeting new officers and helping them get acclimated to the agency. But official documents obtained by Muckrock in 2017 seem to indicate that Angleton was still handling operations for years after being fired. True to form, the CIA has refused to confirm or deny these claims. Angleton spent the rest of his time speaking endlessly to anyone who would listen about the global threat of communism and the need for an ends-justify-the-means approach to global intelligence. He was a featured character in several different television productions and fictional stories, including a BBC series about the Cambridge Five called The Company and the William F. Buckley novel Spy Time. In 1986, Angleton developed lung cancer. He finally gave up cigarettes and alcohol and seemed to face his coming end with solemnity. He confided in his friend, journalist Joseph Trento, I did things that, in looking back on my life, I regret. But I was part of it and I loved being in it. Alan Dulles, Richard Helms, Carmel Offey, and Frank Wisner were the grandmasters. If you were in a room with them, you were in a room full of people that you had to believe would deservedly end up in hell. I guess I will see them there soon. James Jesus Angleton died on May 11, 1987. At the memorial service, his friend, poet and professor Reed Whitmore, read East Corker, a poem from Angleton's favorite writer, T.S. Eliot. Home is where one starts from. As we grow older, the world becomes stranger, the pattern more complicated, of dead and living, not the intense moment isolated with no before and after, but a lifetime burning in every moment, and not the lifetime of one man only, but of old stones that cannot be deciphered. Okay.
that concludes that story. Brandon, what, what did you think? It's a very interesting story, as always. Uh, <laughs> uh, this story's got all kind of weird characters, and that, that um, the murder of the lady is incredibly bizarre, too. And just Mary like, Meyer. Yeah. And so, oh, what was it? Wis- what, Wisner's? Uh, wife or something like, hey, how you doing? And then yeah, dead a Frank Wisner's later. wife yeah. drives by and says, like, sees Mary Meyer on the, you know, on her walk and says, hi, how are you doing? And they talk for a minute, and then like minutes later, Mary Meyer is shot to death in broad daylight. And they tried to blame it on a person of a dark persuasion, <sighs> which is is incredibly convenient. Yeah, I. That's another story that just, it's amazing how it, like I said, it happened in public, in a park, in broad daylight, and they still couldn't figure out who did it. And also, it seemed like Kennedy um, really liked her, but at the same time, Kennedy really liked a lot of people. So I'm curious if she really was the one for him. You know, I don't think so. The, the weed and the weed and acid. Yeah, it was it, it was the weed and acid talking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, from what I understand, Kennedy, uh, JFK was, you know, renowned as a ladies' man, but uh, he was not known That's for a his way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was not known for his endurance. Uh, <laughs> uh, he was. Uh, the people around him called uh, his escapades his little aspirin um, because he would, you know, maybe 30 seconds. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> he just needed, it was just like a real quick thing every time. That's off track. That's way off track. But yeah, that's what gets me is the amount of conspiracy theories that blossomed because of jim angleton's cover my ass mentality (laughs) well you always leave a footprint yeah and then going back to cover your tracks often leaves more tracks yeah just a different time yeah because it it's one thing you know like his defenders would say that a lot of the stuff that he did the illegal activity the reading the mail and his paranoia about you know other soviet defectors that all of that was done whether you agree with the morals of it or not it was done in pursuit of national security but all of his actions in the wake of john f kennedy's assassination were purely self-motivated they were you know him doing that to protect his job and i don't think that at least from everything that I've read, there was much of an argument to be made that he, you know, he did that in the interest of the United States. Oh, well, liar's going to lie. Yeah. And yeah, he was uh, really good at it for a while anyway. All right. Well, that's uh, a wrap on Jim Angleton. We'll be back to, uh, you know, with our next proper episode to discuss the uh, final chapter of Frank Wisner. Um, His is probably of all, you know, of all the founding fathers of the CIA, his story is probably the most tragic. And I'm, uh, I'm really interested to tell that story and share that with you guys. Yeah. Thanks for listening. As always, you know, hit us up on the socials. If you want to find the uh, links to the information, our sources, for the episode, you can go to our website, ciafiles.net. Uh, at the website, you can also find uh, our um, merchandise shop and links to all our socials. And, uh, you know, follow us on Twitter at CIA Files Podcast, Facebook.com slash CIA Files, Instagram at CIA Files. And thanks for listening. And uh, have a great time. Great day. Great. Bye-bye. Bye.